church family. Happy Sabbath. I was uh, talking to, to Pastor Rodley, and, and uh, I, I guess it dawned on me, I have not preached here in almost two years. That's been a long time. I didn't even think about that and, until just recently when we were talking to the back. Um, I have a little, a little exercise that I'd like to start our church service with. Um, uh, Christians should be known by their faith, yes. There's a song, Christians should be known by their love. Christians should be known by their love. And if you're guilty like me this morning, you may have not verbally communicated that four-letter word. Maybe you haven't received that four-letter word in a while, but I'd like you to take 15 seconds to wake yourself up and encourage the person behind you and in front of you and say, I love you. <laughs> if that felt awkward for you, then it means you're not using the word enough. Amen. <laughs> It's good to be here with my Campion family. I'm excited to, to, to share with you this morning. I'll give you a quick, quick, uh, couple quick highlights of the Literature Ministries Department. Um, uh, God is good. We've had the, uh, uh, more people involved in the literature work than ever before. More books have been shared. More people that signed up for Bible studies. God is really growing this ministry. And uh, I would make an appeal to any young adult here, young person, uh, the very best thing that you can do for your entire life is to work for Jesus. Amen? The best thing you can do. You're like, well, I can make just as much money going to Taco Bell. Exactly. <laughs> work for Jesus is the best thing for you in this entire world. And I would love to chat with you about, about working for him this summer with, with me and the others involved in this ministry. You know, this is a testimony that wouldn't be published anywhere. It's very subtle, it's very small, but it's, it's meaningful really to me. And I think it illustrates an impact of what our literature is, is doing in our community. Just before Christmas break, I was working with one of our Campion students, and they knocked on a door, and they said, oh, I already have that book. And they showed him another book. I already have that book. And went through their entire bag, and they had every single one of our books that we carry. And we asked, what do you think about them? It's like, well, I'm almost through this one. It's a beautiful book, and I'm going to read this one next. We go our way down the street, and we knock on another door. And uh, the first book that the, the, the different Campion student shared was our cookbook. It's just a cookbook, right? Well, she shared a cookbook, and the person said, oh, wait, let me run inside and come back out. And she had a cookbook, dirty as all get out. She's like, I'm cooking with it right now. <laughs> Our health message is a beautiful thing. Amen? I had a student uh, that worked with me this summer. Her, their, her dad reached out to me and he said, I've lost 40 pounds from reading your health books and applying them, obviously. So God is good. He's making an impact on our, uh, with, our, with our young people, with our literature that we're carrying. It's making a difference in people's lives. And... Uh, I was looking, reflecting on, on some of why this work is growing the way it is. And God gets all the glory, but honestly, I think God's working on some of your hearts as well to get involved and help our young people. I, I, don't, I didn't ask for permission to share this, but there's a family here with the last name that rhymes with, with uh, Pong. Or, or long, but that's not their last name. I didn't get permission to share it. And you, If you know who you are, you know who you are. But they went out of the way, drove all the way down to Denver to take all 30 of our kids out to Chipotle this summer. And I don't know if they know this, because I don't think I told them, but they took us, took us all out, out to Chipotle and uh, paid, paid for, 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 for the whole bill. And that day, they had extra, less time in the field because it took a long time to get 30 young people through the line at Chipotle. But that day, they had more books out. It was a record-breaking day the, for, the, for, the, for, for that point, at least, for the entire summer. And I'm, I'm thinking, why is that? It's because our kids were feeling supported in the fields. 
So support our missionaries. It makes a difference in them. And others of you I know have, have made donations to support this ministry as well, and I want to thank you for that. And one last thing before I get into the message. I know I'm running out of time. But some of you may not be um, as, how shall I put this, excited <laughs> about going door to door. No problem. I understand God works in, in different ways. Um, but I, wanna, I, wanna, I don't want to ruin too much for our, our breakout seminar later today. But uh, my wife and I took a week off, well-deserved week off, and we went on a cruise back, back in October. And Sabbath morning on this cruise ship, I, uh, I brought my favorite shirt with me, this, this guy right here. Put that thing on to, to head up to get some breakfast. And uh, I walked into the elevator, and, and someone looked at me, so an older, older woman on, on, in, the, in this crammed elevator. She looked at me, and she's like, I like your shirt. And I smiled, and she smiled, and then everyone looked in the elevator. And uh, two, two kids, two, two, two what appeared to be high school age kids, they, they looked at it. They're like, we're Seventh-day Adventist, <laughs> just like blatantly. And then the lady that looked at me originally looked at like, what's a Seventh-day Adventist? And there's this whole like interesting dialogue in the elevator on the way to the buffet. <laughs> I go into the buffet, lunchtime now. And I'm sitting down and some lady comes up to me. She's like, I've been staring at your shirt for the last 30 minutes. What are you? I'm a, I'm a human. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, like, what church do you go to? Found out she, she, she was involved in the Adventist church as well and had this all long conversation and, and blah, blah, blah. And uh, then I'm walking around trying to burn off those calories around the ship and vo- enjoying the sun and the, and the ocean. And, and someone runs after me and they're like, hey, I love your shirt. Easy way to witness. That's all I'm trying to say. Amen. Easy way to witness. There's the back of it. If you want to get one, I'm not affiliated with them all, but, but Google SDA shirts. SDA shirts is where you can find one, and uh, Sherry's over here. We've been working on our own version of this, and uh, hopefully we'll have some of those available for, for you to, to sport as well. Anyways, enough small talk. Let's get into the Bible this morning. I, I, uh, how many of you want to be blessed? You want to be blessed? I, I do too. We need the Spirit of God. He needs to be poured out upon us. Anything I say, I'm an unpolished speaker, preacher, but God is alive, He's real, and He wants to touch us. Amen? So let's pray and ask God to bless us. Father in heaven, Lord, you're coming soon. And we ask that you would prepare us for that soon coming. That this morning, our time in this church, would not just be in a casual encounter, Lord, but we want to have a deep, rich experience with you. We want to taste and see that you are good. Lord, we want your spirit to be poured out upon us. And so we ask for that. I ask that you would speak through me, that people wouldn't even see me, but they would see you in these words. Lord, bless us and give us courage to apply what we hear this morning as well. We thank you and we pray in your name. Amen. Our theme, theme verse this morning is uh, found in Matthew, chapter 5, verse 6. Anyone ever have a, a craving for f- something, some food item? I, uh, I used to live back in, back in Michigan, and occasionally I'd have to fly to various places to, uh, to go, go to different meetings. And uh, as I'd fly to different places, I'd leave Chicago... And each time I'd, I'd come back from Chicago, I'd go out of my way, roughly an extra hour added to my trip, to go to Giorgiano's Pizza. Anyone ever been there? Maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. It's one of my favorite pizza places. It's a, I get this deep dish. It's like literally just like that thick, juicy, not heavenly pizza. And I went out of my way every single time I'd, I'd fly to Chicago to go pick up this pizza and bring it home. And we'd just have this, this feast of a pizza. But my desire for that pizza pales into comparison to one guy one night back in 1976. It's recorded that Elvis Presley was said to have a craving for fool's gold loaf. 
fool's gold loaf, a sandwich he once had at the Colorado Mine Company in Denver. Elvis and his friends reportedly jumped on his private plane from Nashville and traveled to Denver just to eat the sandwich. According to NPR, the sandwich was a hollowed loaf of Italian bread slathered with butter with a whole jar of peanut butter and jelly and a pound of fried bacon. He needs one of our books. All fried together. All, sorry, deep fried together. The sandwich costs $49.99. Adjusted for inflation closer to $200 today if they still still made this. Our theme verse, Matthew 5 verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst not for a pizza or this crazy sandwich, but for righteousness, for they shall be filled. When Jesus the first time the word righteousness appears in the book of, is found in the book of Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 16. And let's, let's open our Bibles. You have your Bibles to, to, to this morning. Open your Bibles with me. Matthew chapter 3, verses 13. We're going to read this, these verses together. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Jesus Traveling to the Jordan, sees John. He wants to get baptized by him. And what is John's immediate reply? I need to be baptized by you, but you're coming to me? When John looked at Jesus, he saw something different. He saw a righteous man. He saw a holy man, a man who, who had not sinned. When we get baptized, we're, it's a symbol of washing away our sins, dying to our old, our old life and be risen to a new life. But Jesus was perfect. John recognized that perfection in, in, in Jesus. Why would I baptize you? You need to baptize me, verse 15. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. Then, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. Jesus fulfilled righteousness. Or if you prefer, Jesus set an example of doing what is right. Righteous is, righteousness isn't just the narrow scope of not doing what is wrong, but it's doing what is right. And Jesus fulfilled righteousness in two different ways in this example. He set an example of how we should be baptized as well. But I think it's a little bit deeper than that. Jesus' baptism was his anointment as the Messiah. Right after this, he began, he began his ministry. In your bulletin, pull that out real quick. I have a little, a little handout printed in there that Teresa graciously included for, for me. It's the 2300-day prophecy of Daniel. <laughs> We're not going to go through the whole 2300-day prophecy of Daniel. Someone say Amen. Beautiful subject, by the way. Oh, and in your, in your pews, if you're not familiar with this, this study, uh, pull out your Connect card and, and say, hey, I do not understand this prophecy. Someone teach me this prophecy. But I'm going to assume that many of you are familiar with this, and we're just going to look at the small section, the 70 weeks of Daniel chapter 9, 24. So we look at our chart. This, this, this special section of prophecies started with a decree to restore and build Jerusalem, 457 B.C. You see that on, on, in, in your bulletin. And then in 27 A.D., something special happened. What was it? Come on, church, where are you at? <laughs> what happened in 27 A.D.? Jesus was, was baptized. Or if you're reading in, 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 this, the, in this actual scripture, his, he was anointed. And then right after his baptism, he no longer was a carpenter, a professional carpenter. He did something different. Basically, everything we read in the Gospels, all focused in on this little section of the three and a half years. At the end of this three and a half years, Jesus, the Messiah, was, was cut off, and he died. Why am I bringing this up? The, 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 the subject of righteousness is illustrated here in Daniel 
Jesus was anointed at his baptism. He began his ministry for three and a half years before he was, he was cut off or died. Righteousness is broader than just not doing wrong. It's also doing what is right. When we are baptized, we're, no long, we're not just saying, hey, I want to I live a, a pure life, which is something we should aim for. But we also are saying, My, I, have a new, I have a new goal. I have a new focus. I have a mission. And that is to bring the gospel to the world. Amen? You're with me. Good. My greatest job as a pastor isn't just to lead you to surrender your, your life to Christ, but it's to lead you to be a minister as well. I hear someone say that, I've heard someone say, this is years ago, not, not in this church, <laughs> definitely not this church, but I heard someone say that I don't want to go to this church so-and-so anymore because when I go to this church, I, I don't get blessed at that church. I think that's the wrong way to view coming to church. We shouldn't come to church just to be blessed, though that is a wonderful side product. We should come to church to be a blessed scene. Amen? Otherwise, we can go home and watch Doug Boucher online. (laughs) We should come to church to be a blessing to those around you. Your smile is contagious. Your words of comfort are needed. Our studies together, they're they're useful. We come to church to be a blessing to each other. Now, you may look at this this little prophecy. You may see the ministry of John. You're like, well, I I get I should be a, a minister to a sense. I should reach out. But I'm not an elder in my church. I'm not, a, I'm not a pastor in my church. Well, what impact can I make? Go back with me to this, this prophecy again. After Jesus' baptism, the prophecy doesn't end. Where does it end? With someone being martyred. What was his name? It's right there in the, in the, in the chart. Stephen. Was Stephen an apostle? Was, was Stephen a, a head elder? <laughs> Church, what am I getting at? Stephen was, was a deacon. He was the guy that vacuumed the floor. And in the Bible, that last sermon of Stephen's life was powerful. Stephen was a preacher. We are called to preach just the same way, to lead people closer to him. Righteousness is, is doing what is right, not just not doing what is wrong. Righteousness is doing what is right, not just not doing what is wrong. I like to summarize righteousness with the three S's. Service, sacrifice, and steadfastness. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst to be in a right standing with God. Blessed are you when you live a life to give glory to your Creator. Blessed are you when you are praying and focusing on how you can share some good news with others. And don't mishear me. Righteousness is not just service or sharing good news. That is just one component that makes up that word. Go with me to Psalms. This is my favorite, probably my favorite Bible verse. There's a lot of good ones. But this is definitely on the list. Write this verse down. Put it in your car. Psalms 139, verse 1. Psalms 139, verse 1. Read with me. It says, O Lord, you have searched me and you, what's the word? Know me. Skip forward. All the way to the end of the chapter, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way within me and lead me in the way of everlasting. When I was was a kid, I was probably seven or eight years old, I uh, was standing in line with my mom at Hinky Dinky. Anyone ever heard of Hinky Dinky? <laughs> it was the name of the grocery store in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska at the time. Hinky Dinky. And I saw this beautiful purple gum pack. I wasn't even allowed to chew gum, but I really wanted to. And so I grabbed this, this, this candy, this, this pack of purple gum, and I put it in my pocket. 
And when I got home, <clears throat> I went to the darkest part of my house, walked across the red, shaggy carpet into the laundry room, and I opened up my forbidden treasure and popped in my mouth one of these cubes of purple gum. I made I chewed it maybe four times when I spit it out of my mouth in disgust. I was like, this is not even good. And to this day, I do not know if that gum was actually gross or if I just felt so guilty eating it that I couldn't enjoy it. I, I don't know. But friends, this is what sin does to us. It leads us into the dark places, it causes us to hide. When Adam and Eve sinned, they covered themselves with, with leaves and hid. Jesus showed up, his calm, loving, tender voice, and they hid from Jesus. Friends, sin leads us to hide, leads us to shame. This verse here in Psalms appeals to us. Do not hide from your creator. Do not justify yourself. You may say, it's uh, that thing I did wrong was not that big of a deal. That thing, is, is that, that sin was just not that sinful. When we justify ourselves, we're, we're covering ourselves with leaves, just like Adam and Eve in the garden. Christ wants us to open our hearts to him. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Look for sin. See if there's any wicked way within me and lead me in the way of everlasting. Christ wants us to have that kind of attitude toward him. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. And you pray this prayer, search me, O oh God. John chapter 4. Go with me there briefly. John chapter 4, I recall the story of the woman at the well. Jesus caught the Samaritan woman off guard by asking her for some water in the heat of the day. It was noon. All the women got their water hours before the sun was scorching, was scorching heat. But why was she there then? Because she lived a life of shame. No doubt the other ladies knew about her promiscuous life. The woman at the well would rather deal with sunburn and sweat and heat than heartburn and scorn. It was better for her to squint her high eyes in the brightness of the day than her to deal with the dirty looks of the other village ladies. The discourse continues. If you're in, in uh, John chapter 4, go to verse 10. And it says, If you knew the gift of God and knew who it was who, who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have, he would have given you living water. Verse 13, Jesus told her that if she knew who she who she'd ask, if she knew who he was, she'd be asking him for, for living water and she'd never thirst again. Are you are you tracking with me so far? Are you hearing the words thirst over and over in this little piece of, of a Bible? Verse 13, let me read it one more time. Jesus told her that if she knew who he was, she'd ask him for living water and she'd never thirst again. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst. This woman lived a life of shame and regret. She had social anxiety. She was thirsting for a new life, for change, for righteousness. And Jesus offered her living water. The woman, the woman runs back into town. She tells everyone about Jesus and how he knew all these secret things about her life. And just before the whole town comes back to, to Jesus at the well, who shows up? The disciples. In verse 31, the, let's read it together. Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, what's the words? Eat something. But verse 32, the, but then they said to him, but then he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Verse 33, then the disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And 34, 
You've read this a thousand times, oh Lord, but I pray that this would bring new light. Jesus replied, my food is to what? Oh, you're there. My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish the work. Jesus here is, is saying what he was saying in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. My food is to do what is right, what is righteous. I am satisfied by doing what is right. It's noon. Jesus has been walking all day long. He's tired. He's thirsty. He asked for the woman at the well, which, by the way, it doesn't look like he ever got any water from the well. And then, then the disciples show up with physical food. And he says, no, I've already eaten. I've already feasted by doing the will of God. Ah, church, I, I was, uh, my, you're, you're one of your elders here, Bobby Crinney, he's my brother-in-law if you don't know that. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he's fun to watch uh, football games with. I, uh, I don't follow that much. I just never, never got into it. But I've been in a room one time, and, and, uh, and there was these guys watching the game. The game went into overtime. And then as the game's getting heated, it's getting close to the end. It's, it's, it's debatable who's going to win. The, something happens. Someone gets an inter- interception, and the ball's coming to the other side of the field. By now, the other guys in the room are now standing up. There's food on the floor, and no one seems to care. The ball gets brought from one side of the grass lawn to the other side of the grass lawn and crosses a certain line, and then everyone in the room started jumping and screaming, touchdown! Another illustration. I lost some of you. I was in a restaurant one time eating some, some food, a Mexican restaurant, free trips and salsa. Got to love it. I was eating at the restaurant, and they had a soccer game on the screen. The soccer game got to the end of the soccer game, and all of a sudden there's like 10 guys at a table watching the screen, and I hear them all screaming, Goal! Friends, verse 34 is more exciting than someone bringing a ball to one side of the grass lawn than the other. We should be excited. Ugh. These kids, there's these kids I saw on YouTube. He went on stage. It's like hundreds of kids in this little little high school. And this kid went on stage and he and he and he just took a ball, a bottle like this, and he like flipped it. But then it stood up. <laughs> it stood up like that. And then all of a sudden this entire crowd of kids started jumping and screaming and chanting. Friends. Verse 34 is more exciting than a piece of plastic water bottle standing up on the ground. Jesus was physically hungry and thirsty, but he was physically satisfied by preaching the gospel. You ever been hungry in the middle of a basketball game? Probably not. (laughs) This was his game. The woman at the well's life was changed and she became a missionary to the town that led the whole town to Christ. Literally. Jesus stayed at the well. The woman brought the crowd back to the well and Jesus preached to them right next to the well. And the illustration can't be ignored. Jesus was saying, I am the water of life. I will satisfy you like nothing else can satisfy you. Some of us here in this room, the back of your mind, you're like, man, I just, I'm not thirsty. I want to be. I'm not, I'm not hungering for righteousness like you're trying to, to communicate. What do, I, what do I do about it? John, 1 John 4.19 has a beautiful promise in it. It says we love him because he first loved us. But did you catch the promise in that simple verse? We do love him. It doesn't say you're gonna love him. We do love him because he first loved us. The only issue in that verse that that we should really be wrestling with is do you realize how much Jesus really loves you? 
And if you don't, that's why you're not thirsty. You can do acts of righteousness and make yourself look good, but if you're not doing it out of a loving, desiring relationship with Christ, you're working your way to heaven and it's not going to get you there. You must love to be righteous. You must love to follow Christ. You must do it out of love and that's not going to happen until you realize how much more Jesus loves you. And that's your choice. It comes down to you. You must give Jesus your time. If you're not spending time with God, you're not going to realize how much he loves you until it's too late. My appeal to you at the beginning of this year, the first Sabbath of 2024, is to hunger and thirst for righteousness. In other words, pursue God. Spend time with Him in prayer, in your Bible, serving Him like you've never served before. In your Connect cards, I want to connect with, with you, and the pastors do as well. You may, there may be someone here who's really struggling with a desire even to hunger and thirst. Friends, this is war. This is spiritual war. And you do not have to face war alone. We're a church for a reason. We're, we're here to help each other. Put in a connect card and just say, hey, I need help to hunger and thirst. Help me. Some of you may be struggling in some kind of sin. You know that sin is, is not righteous. You're not alone. Put it down on the card. Say, hey, I need help. There's warriors in this church that will come and support you and help you. And there may be someone here that says, hey, I never really thought of righteousness in the sense of serving. I've been a Christian for years, and I don't really know where I fit in the realm of serving God. If you want to say, hey, help me serve, put that down there as well. Friends, we're a family. We're here to help and support each other. In 2015, a Minnesota-based YouTuber made a chicken sandwich from scratch. The complicated process included growing and then harvesting wheat, raising and slaughtering a chicken, Milking a cow, turning cheese, boiling water for salt, ocean water for salts, growing an entire garden and extracting oil from seeds. The whole thing cost him $1,500 to make one chicken sandwich. And it took him six months after tasting the sandwich. He looks at his friend, kind of shrugs his shoulders, and he's like, It's all right. What took him $1,500 in six months, he didn't even really enjoy that much. Friends, you don't have to work and wait and spend that kind of time and money to start your relationship with Jesus. As a woman at the well, Jesus made righteous right away. She began that journey right away. She became a missionary that very hour. That's our job. That's our goal. It's just to lead people to Jesus. He's over here. He's about this. I want to pray with you. Father in heaven, Lord bless us. We're your children. We thank you that you would lead and guide us. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Hasty. Um, and if you can respond with a Connect card, um, Pastor Leandro pointed out that there's a QR code you can use in the bulletin also. And as we pass the offering baskets, anything you put in the envelopes will be put to what you specify on the envelope. And loose offerings will go to support the Campion Church budget. And uh, I just thank you for being generous and supporting the ministries of this local church.
you're standing, this will make it a lot easier. It's the first Sabbath of the year, and there's something special about connecting with someone. So in your pew, maybe even in front of you, you want to put your arms right on the person's shoulders right next to you. Can you do that? We're going to have a prayer together. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, Lord, thank you for loving us, for leading us, for guiding us. Thank you for the Sabbath. Lord, let our hearts just burn with more, more love towards you. We thank you and we pray in your name.